It's interesting because you know what just came on is iTunes sort of just opened up into breath music. Yeah. <laughs> All by itself. <laughs> it, it wasn't by itself, but. Well, <laughs> not on, not on, not on my conscious part. It just. <laughs> There well, are, it there depends are lots of, on what you lots mean of tracking, lots of tracking mechanisms. <laughs> How are you? I have a bed. I have a house mm -hmm. now. I, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good for you. Thank you. Do, you. do you have an address? Yes. Do you want to give it to me? If I give it to you, I'm giving it to everybody. But, oh, uh, oh, okay. I didn't know. No, absolutely <laughs> not. I, I don't know who's on here now. I'll send it to you. Um, okay. Yeah, I have two. I have two thousand something subscribers. Average show will get two hundred, three hundred, depending on how much, you know, the algorithms are doing their thing. But I have a decent amount of followers. I've done a lot of shows. So what? Are, what are the shows? Are they anything like the interviews you did um, in Uber? Uh, not like that. The, the Uber interviews, I think, were more like just fun exploring. These mm -hmm. these shows are just part of my journey, so mm -hmm. they, they include everything I've been through. Um, but yeah, the, the, the show happened kind of out of the blue, out of itself. Like, I didn't... I kind of had an idea that I wanted to have something where I was... It was fully me and not affected by anything or anybody else or any entity or any anything. And that's how this snail show thing came about. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Oops. How have you been? Um, well, you know, I, I had six people die this year, one of whom was my best friend, which I really helped with for the whole year. Mm -hmm. So that, that was huge, huge, huge. 40 years we were friends. And her husband suicided six months before while she was deathly ill. <laughs> so it, it's been that kind of year. <laughs> big, wow. big, big. Wow. Lots of... Um, six people. But me, yeah, six. Three of them I knew really well. And another three were close but not you know, not nearly the heart center as the other three were. Mm -hmm. So. And how, and are, you, how are you dealing hard. with that? How are you dealing with that sort of loss? I, I know you're sort of not used to it, but I know you, at least your book was about dealing with that sort of thing. So at least mm -hmm. you were prepared in that aspect, right? Well, uh, also, is this part of a public audience or is this you, just you and me? No, it's public. It's my channel, but I would preface that or afterwards that with saying that my audience is very intimate with me and uh, mm -hmm. I don't mm -hmm. attract trolls and they get it mm -hmm. very much. So okay. as far as you okay. not wanting to, you know, be vulnerable, that they all they all get it very much. Okay. Um, I think every death is pretty much like every birth, really unique there can be some similarities in the journey and it depends on the illness uh if it's a violent death if it's intentional if it's somebody who who's completed their life you know really a full life so each death is really individual and because of this one person i knew so well i just um i just surrendered to really being in service for that whole year to her. Mm -hmm. And it was really rewarding, but it was like total, um, I gave her all my attention as she needed it. Mm -hmm. So, and then her kids came the last week or two and kind of didn't want me around anymore. <laughs> <laughs> we want her. <laughs> and then yeah. it was really hard. They didn't realize how hard it was going to be. And they, they never said, well, we wish you'd been there, but I have a feeling it would have gone differently. Yeah, had yeah. They had that, yeah. yeah. But, you know, I, I trust the universe. This was 
these were the lessons that, you know, had to be learned. Um, and let's see, had a couple of great trips. Um, I was in Taos with Diane Haug, and it was on Jung and Alchemy, and that was really fun. It was just wonderful. Um, uh, Monica Wickman was teaching, and it was a great group. It was a wonderful, wonderful high experience. Um, so Diane wasn't leading. She was kind of co-leading. She kind of held the group, and Monica did the teaching about alchemy. Monica's an, a Jungian analyst who lives in near Tsuki, Santa Fe area. Mm. Yeah, I wanted to go to, I saw all the Taos invitations and I, I wanted to, and I've been mm -hmm. wanting to get back to breath work, but there's always the money uh, <laughs> restrictions. Absolutely. I somehow yeah. even got past the money restrictions to get to the one that I went to, which was kind of miraculous in and of itself. But Yeah, yeah. Because that was like $1,700. Did That's they give you a break at all or what happened? No. I... Actually, my, si my of, sister, I showed my sister, I told my sister about breathwork as I had gotten into it. I was researching Stan Groff and the, the, the whole thing. So I'm, I don't remember even how I got into that. But mm -hmm. once I saw and I ordered his book and I read the book to an extent and I kind of felt what was coming through with the breathwork and... I also mm -hmm. did my own personal breathwork thing. I, I think I might have shared that with you guys there. Yeah, yeah. Um, and experienced that. And, you know, I just, I felt that I needed to go and experience it with a group. And once mm -hmm. I had that intent, once I had that sort of thing that said, like, this needs to happen, then it happened and I was able to pay for it. Oh, that's great. That's yeah. great. Well, maybe you can um, focus your intention to come back and do some more sometime. <laughs> I do want to, yeah. I think it's going to happen at some point. I don't know. My, like, my life has been just all over the place. Yeah. Um, I've, I've felt like I've, I have this light touch with you over the last couple of years. It's kind of nice. Yeah. Um, um, I had a week with my sons and sons-in-law in October for my 71st birthday, sort of, you know, covered a lot of holidays at once. Mm -hmm. And we did a road trip from here up to Canada. And we just hung out together and ate and played cards and talked and, you know, a lot of walking. And it was just, it was really wonderful could have gone anywhere in the world and I said no let's let's do something easy I'm kind of tired after all this <laughs> death and dying you know right. <laughs> so I really adore them I really I can't tell you how much I adore them um and then what did I do oh, I just came back from Portland and Seattle I was teaching dreaming animals with the Portland Young Society and that really went beautifully so you're still you're still very much involved with the your Jungian uh, community then. I am. Um, I'm. Uh, I teach in Boston, and I also am on the board out here in Western Mass. And I, like this fall, I did a presentation on the nightmare and the numinous, and mm. you know, work through animal stories and dreams. It was good. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm still. Uh, I don't know what your knowledge is of this, but I've been reading your books still, and I know I haven't oh, really? been telling you a lot wow. about it, but it's Good. they're kind of sporadic. They come like there's another one coming, you know, in a couple of days, mm -hmm. but uh, I still remember that experience, and I actually want to finish the book, even though it has lots of chapters. It has like forty chapters or something. I think yeah, I'm, right, I'm probably right. I wrote it. I know it took a long time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But uh, it's, it's, it's good like, though. It's like a meditation. That book is like a meditation. You yeah. can dive in anywhere. And then the people, like, the way I do my channel is that the people don't know what's coming or when it's coming or how it's coming. And they kind of, like, got with that flow. 
So it's... Ooh, nice. As you oppose that to the society thing where it's like you get up at the time and you go do the same thing and then you come back and watch TV or whatever, like it's opposing to that. Yeah. And it it provides some freshness to listening experience Mm -hmm. and even your mind like trying to remember when the last episode happened or maybe you didn't even know if it happened or, you know, you're just in a certain (laughs) chapter. One of the one of the wonderful things about aging, Gary, is memory changes. Uh-huh. So, for instance, I may have read a book, I can't remember it at all. <laughs> so it's right. brand new. It's like yeah, it's fresh. Exactly. That's like one of the hidden pieces is being present much more. So that it's like if I saw a movie or read a book or not so much if I've met people, but there is this way that that the present becomes more the present as I'm aging. Mm-hmm. And you and do, it's not, you somehow retain the memories. Right, it doesn't but, feel like dementia or anything. Right, but they become yeah, not, yeah, not they become not as, they, not as restricted, not as constricted inside your mind. Like maybe if it comes, it comes, and if it doesn't, you're okay. Right. With it. Right, right. And I always think when I'm getting ready to teach, you know, I prepare and prepare and prepare, but uh. You know, it's like whatever comes is going to come. Right. right. <laughs> you know, you hope, you hope you kind of stay with it. That's like how breath work is. Like, you're not supposed to sit on expectations. And I had no clue what was going to happen. And what actually happened, it, because of my expectations, they sit down further and further as far as what I'm pretending I'm not expecting and whatnot. But even as far as those went, I still mm-hmm. didn't see it coming. Like, what what uh, that experience actually was isn't that wonderful yeah it was good yeah yeah the spontaneity of it all yeah and just hearing everybody around you like you were Mm -hmm. in such an uh uh, i forget how he called it how did he say like the it's a non-normal i forget how he worded it um not not ordinary -ordinary. non-ordinary non-ordinary way of, of perceiving Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. With, and that's not even involving drugs or anything whatsoever. It's breath work and music and being surrounded by yeah. a, whole, a whole bunch of people that are doing it's the same thing. It's actually quite, like, quite yeah. simple. <laughs> <laughs> it's about as simple as you can get. <laughs> right. It's, except that the community and the people doing the holding are really pre-processed people. Mm-hmm. So yeah, they, because they're not can... really in the way. They're helpful. Yeah, because the internal experience is so diverse as far as even what they're expressing to the people, you know. And so if somebody's getting up and trying to run or something or somebody starts crying or somebody starts Mm -hmm. doing dolphin movements or whatever, you know, people start doing Mm -hmm. what to the normal mind would be like insane (laughs) asylum, like immediately, right? Right, 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 right. But then well, once they come through and out of that, then they all become, again, so-called normal, and they discuss, we discuss our experiences, and it's a very beautiful sort of thing. Rational, what it, yeah, 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 yeah. Yep. Well, maybe breath work is a little like being born and dying. Each is very unique, although you might see kind of a template of how things go. But there's a lot of variation in it. But just the the common theme of holding the space and allowing people to express what they need to express and not judging, you know, being there for them. Mm -hmm. Even if you, as the sort of sitter, have no clue what they're doing or why. And you usually don't know what they're doing. (laughs) (laughs) Not really. You know, you kind of have to trust the process. Mm -hmm. And, And I think that's one of the greatest gifts of this is that it's really about the power within yeah um i think all the sitting i've done in breath work over the years has really helped in being present for the dying mm-hmm. you know it's it's ju- you know you're just there and you breathe and all kinds of things are happening and you don't judge it and you just go with the flow and you can't you know you don't have to reject it you can just like marvel at what happens in the body and the mind. So are you with a lot of these people as they actually pass or is that? Well, well with these people, I was with several right up until like a a day or two before. And then 
those particular people got taken over by their immediate family, which is okay. So I wasn't with them, but um, for all intents and purposes, I watched, sat with, listened to my friend, watching her come apart day by day by day. It, it was astonishing. Um, and I think it, the, they said at the very end it was very difficult. Mm-hmm. So um, not peaceful. And so really the one person I've been with through the whole entire journey so intimately is the one I wrote about. Mm-hmm. Um, I had a colleague who was, I think, 94, and I was with her the day before she died died and she was really going through a process and her son was their adult son and I was there and she was talking to whatever and uh, she was trying to complete things and apologize and there was some unfinished stuff going on and she was really restless really restless yeah. and um, when the when the husband's wife came in I I surrendered my spot by her bed and let let them be there together and they told me that she died in the morning but it wasn't until they put her little dog on her chest (laughs) and she could let go yeah so i know the book was about a a previous sort of close friend but you're saying you had a you know your best friend of 40 years passed recently was were those very similar or was was it like the the one that was actually your very very close friend was that more difficult for you how did, how did that compare with the other one um well i don't think either one of them were really difficult because i think i surrendered you know mm-hmm. i mean there's a lot of time involved and practical issues but i didn't um you know, I wasn't resisting what was pretty clear. I think the one with the person I went through and wrote about, there was a lot more organized support and there were more support people involved. So the whole thing was kind of filled with more grace and there was no hospital stuff involved. She did this all on her own at home. Whereas my friend could not make any decision about hospice, so hospice came like a day before she died. Uh, And there was so much less preparation in her and in her family. So it really helps to be prepared and more clear about what you you want. So, and she, my friend, was having transfusions almost every other day for almost a year. It was a blood cancer, very different. So mm-hmm. she became weaker and weaker and weaker. Um, you know, so I really watched her dismantle physically in a very different way than my um, the person I wrote about, who was rather intact except for this major liver tumor cutting off her portal vein. So would you say very like, different. would you say your friend was, was she having fear about it or just uneasiness in general because people know they're going to die you know you're here you're going to pass on at some point so was she just like well, it's very different when you're feeling yourself you're losing yourself she really felt like she was losing herself mm-hmm. it was like there wasn't a center that held mm-hmm. um I don't think she had done a lot of thinking about or reflecting on death and dying and She just hadn't. A lot of people don't. Mm -hmm. She knew about it, but she was um, focused on other stuff. Yeah. Well, I mean, we don't we don't teach that concept (laughs) generally. Yeah, I I believe we should. (laughs) (laughs) We say, you know, put them in a box, and you know they're gonna. We don't even teach. Uh, like a good way to dispose of the body for the most part like the body in my opinion should be going back to the earth like inside of the earth not inside of the box not even necessarily cremated i don't even know if that's as far as if there's energy that's transmitting there's green there's green burials now here where you can get wrapped in a like a cloth and the special netting 
that allows mushrooms to grow from your body. <laughs> yeah. But it's you you bury somebody with no box, no nothing. But mm-hmm. that's there are green burial alternatives, at least here. That makes complete and sense place, to me. Like Yeah. That's what happens when an animal gets run over on the street, like if they don't get picked up by the animal control. The bugs come, you oh. know, the, the, yeah, the, that the other carnivore, the, the buzzards or whatever, they come and they get dismantled correctly and they go, the mm-hmm. molecular arrangement goes back into the earth rather than like decomposing right. inside of the box that's separate from all of that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Because if you take the idea that if you don't take the standard idea, the standard dogmatic religious idea that like you, you die and then your spirit goes to heaven or hell, if you take the idea that, that somehow, somehow life keeps going naturally and organically and it's some sort of transition, right, to something else, yeah, then yeah. it wouldn't make any sense to stick the, the housing unit for your spirit, which is the body, inside <laughs> of this box or even to burn it. Like maybe I don't even know if burning it is great. I, I don't really know. Well, it's a more rapid transformation, and I think there's more carbon released, you know, when you burn things, bodies, mm-hmm. etc. But I think it, fire is a very rapid transformation. Um, decomposition is a slower process. Mm-hmm. So, so probably um, would be more gentle if there still was an aspect of yourself that somehow mm-hmm. stayed with the body through its decomposition, right? Well, you know, the Tibetan Buddhist definitely three days before the body is cremated or buried or anything because the mind is slowly dispersing. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's not about being in a hurry. And um, I think that in the Tibetan Book of the Dead that the mind is dispersing for at least 49 days and there's readings you can do to sort of be talking to whatever is left of that consciousness and helping move it through the bardo states or reminding it there's choices and mm-hmm. reminding it it's it's you're dead you know you're not here anymore <laughs> that's what's happening in case you're wondering um but the tibetans are much slower about the whole thing whereas you know hindu and jewish people they want to not hindu excuse me islamic People like to be buried within 24 hours. Mm-hmm. And um, I don't know if that always has to be in a box, but, you know, underground. It's fast. Yeah, well, I, even in the Egyptian sort of histories, they, the, the tombs and the, the pharaoh's tombs, they would bury them with their own personal items because they had the idea that you would send them off to the next realm with their things, I, I don't even think that's about materialism. I think that's about remembering your own essence as you would uh, pass mm-hmm. on. If somehow, you know, you could actually think about these objects that are with the body as, like, your spirit is transitioning. Well, if you think of those objects as simply, like, altar implements, they're not the spirit in itself. It's what we project on that physical item. Mm-hmm. So it's symbolic, really, you know, um, like putting food. I remember when my, uh, my son was about three, three or four, and our dog died, and we were going to just bury her in the park, you know, woods. woods. And he wanted, he wanted her to be, the puppy, to be wrapped up. I, I remember this. Our dog had had puppies, and several were stillborn. You know, they were beautiful, they smelled wonderful, but, but they didn't live. Yeah. So he wanted them wrapped in a piece of cloth, and he wanted to put a little dog food in the box. <laughs> and maybe a dog toy, you know. But he, So we buried all that together. But at that age, there is much more sense of, well, this is a temporary state. You know, they're kind of sleeping, and they'll, they'll be back. Yeah, right. Yeah, I remember I I buried um, tulip bulbs on top of the little grave, and I felt that was a big lesson. And you know, out of death comes new life, like you said, the green burial stuff. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. But anyway, I think altars and precious things and whatnot, they aren't so much filled with spirit in and of themselves, but our mind projects the stuff into the, those objects. An right. altar is just a pointer. But we, I mean, I know myself personally, currently, I'm not dead, or this body's not dead, so like I can see. You don't think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I can see the objects that have accumulated around me, and I know why they're in that exact spot, how long they've been there, and lots of them have been there for a while, because mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't like bothering with material objects for the most part, but still I know exactly why and where they're there, why they're there, and exactly the location, and if one of them moved, right. I Right, there's I this whole story, yeah. you know. And I don't even narrative my life very much, like, barely at all. I'm more, much more sort of aesthetic and... Uh, What's the one called? I forget names, but I don't I don't apply the narrative as much as probably most people. I simply I am present most of the time, and the material objects don't mean that much. But I know of them, and I know exactly where they are, and mm -hmm. they they do mean something. They they're sort of like the it's a comfort of your like this is the room, and there's a sort of comfort in the things being where I know they are, even if I don't ever touch them. And I will at some point. It's interesting. I, I, was looking for some, <laughs> I was looking for some papers. And I, I have boxes of papers and notes and, you know. And there was a, uh, an old cassette tape. And on it, it said Penny Project. And it was a tape my mother made for me 40 years ago when I was studying family therapy. So I sent her a letter with all these questions about family history and her thoughts and her feel, you know, mm -hmm. she was being very good to answer it, but it was, it was amazing because I had asked questions like, are you afraid of death? What do you, <laughs> you know, along with everything else that I was asking, uh -huh. but she just, it was so neat to find it because she was present at that moment when she was, um, contemplating her life and shared it with me on tape so it's like it's like whoa so what is that <laughs> was, she was just so present yeah i mean i i think most people will actually share if you ask them we have we have well that's it i asked her nobody asked her ever yeah. anything we, yeah. ha we have so many social stigmas and internal biases that say like the you know the norms and everything that stop us from actually doing things but if you ask somebody genuinely in the present without like all of the because people sense if you're asking a question that's loaded in terms of the norms but if you can ask simply like what do you think about dying what do you actually think about it mm -hmm. i think most people if they're feeling uh, safe in that space they'll tell you what they think about it I'm in a group uh, that meets every other Monday night for two hours for, for the last four years, not in the summer. And, and we talk about all this stuff. And it, part of what's wonderful is that there is a, a normalization of the profound mm -hmm. without making a big deal about it. We can talk about anything. Yeah. You know, really. And these are people I, you know, this is not an organized group. It came together kind of just around the notion of aging and living fully and befriending death. But it, it has worked and it's so interesting how safe it is. I'm sure my being really present and open helps. Yeah. Well, it's interesting to me that the thing we have in American society, we have this thing also embedded like that says, if, if you're going to die tomorrow, how are you going to live today, you know? And I'm mm -hmm. thinking like, okay, well, how would that question be changed if we normalized the death aspect? Mm -hmm. Because you're using that as like the polarized trigger to get your ass in movement. But what if death was as normal as life and you're just being a lazy ass or something like... Right, <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know, like... Speaking of which, how has your year been? <laughs> <laughs> I've been actually not. I've been trying to be a lazy ass, but the the things, you know, money comes in and 
It's been a, yeah. a big adventure. I was actually in Canada just like two or three months ago. Oh, where I visited in uh, uh, Lake Powell and Kelowna and uh, yeah, those are the two main ones. More Western Canada. Western Canada, yes. I visited uh, like three, uh, two subscribers up there and I had one in Oregon that I visited. They're actually coming to visit us in uh, January. So I've developed, or the, the community has developed around me uh, with my channel. And I've so let me ask you, people. you said some they're coming to visit us. Who's the us now? <laughs> I don't know. You ready to show your face? Ah, <laughs> oh, I hear. I hear a lovely young woman. I think it's a young woman. She's a young woman. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Hi. How are you? I'm good. This is oh. Andrea and this is yeah. Penny, Penny the dog. Oh. Saki. Sorry. Penny. Did I say Penny? I'm sorry. My words aren't working. Saki the dog. So, this is the us now. This is the us. This is the yeah. current us. Hi. Hi. I'm glad you're there. Me too. Yeah. Me too. yeah. It's good to see you. Good to see you. And what is your name again? Andrea. Andrea. Yeah. Andrea or Andrea? Either one's fine, but okay. Andrea. Yeah. 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 So, okay, so how did Andrea come into your life? <laughs> she was another subscriber. Is. You're still a oh, subscriber, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> She's from North Carolina. Cool. And that whole thing somehow happened, but it was, again, without lots of uh, mm -hmm. manipulation by either side. Uh-huh. I was a little worried about the thing in England. <laughs> <laughs> Many of us were, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. I had mm -hmm. a few I had a few hiccups, but <laughs> I yes. <laughs> I've had many hiccups. That's yeah. normal for me. I'm just there's always things happening. You do seem happier. You do seem better. Yes. Well, I mean I was just like all over the place, all over the place, and now it's mm -hmm. relatively stabilized, but like the things around my life particularly keep uh, being very dynamic and um, challenging at the very minimum, mm. but having her with me here is good. It's a good thing. Mm -hmm. It sounds like your dad was pretty good. Did you, did you watch the show? No, I didn't watch the show. I thought, I just remember at points when we talked or made contact, I had the sense your father was being pretty kind to you. Yes, yes. He, he was definitely a sort of strong point or uh, mm -hmm. solidity in my life when it was all like flying apart. That, yes, I remember that. <laughs> yeah. So, mm -hmm. yes, he, uh, he was very good. Yeah, I'm really glad. So and I'm glad I've you turned somewhat, to him. Somewhat of a yeah, I did. I, I, I mean, I was I've been semi semi homeless for two years, as you. I know. I've told I know. you about. Um, that was along with. It's been like exploring, you know. For me, I've been exploring this entire time, and mm -hmm. it started when the other relationship ended. That was when like my ex actual exploration started, mm -hmm. and. Uh, you know, so much has happened and more has happened in these two years than I could say that has happened in my entire life. Mm. And so it's been like a very compacting of the experience and mm -hmm. lots of, <laughs> lots of stress, lots of trauma, lots of energetic things that just hit me out of the blue that wow. I have to wow. sort of mm -hmm. survive. Like some of them are very, very traumatic. Like, like what? Just like, <laughs> these are hard things to describe exactly. I've described almost all of them to various people, but mm -hmm. like for instance, I'll be driving down the street and some things will line up in my mind and mm -hmm. uh, there will be what feels like some sort of panic attack coming on. And I'm, mm -hmm. I'm very uh, implacable for the most part. It's hard to bother me, but if the mm -hmm. certain amount of things line up, then like 
I've had multiple cases in the last year where I had to pull over, go sit in the grass, try to ground with the earth, and then like this <laughs> wave of energy like wants to tear my body apart or wants to do something very <laughs> unpleasant. Uh, so I deal with it, you know, and <laughs> I'm in those in those cases I'm ready I'm ready to die actually like I'm ready to like obliterate or whatever mm-hmm. because that's mm-hmm. what the that's what the feelings are telling and I sit with it and wait <laughs> so you keep breathing <laughs> keep breathing yeah like mm-hmm. some of some of the sort of energies that move through this realm are so powerful that you can't mm-hmm. do anything other than surrender to them or I mean, I've tried, like, different mental uh, sort of positions with regards to these things that happen, and there's almost, like, there's no self-action that can resolve them. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's surrender. It's the same thing. Yeah. It sounded, uh, in, in a way, it has some of that feeling of um, the energy of the movement of the chakras when... Like when it meets a blockage, I'm sure it's very explosive, you know, and it blasts through in some ways. But I mean, it does it's a little like when Groff describes spiritual emergency? You know, it's just things are waking up, reorganizing. Yep. And so like you want to, man- I, I want to manage, I want to manage it when it's happening. Like I want, to, like, oh well, yeah, do this, do. like pull the car over. You know, like I'm doing controlling things, but. I can't do, I still can't do anything about it. I cannot, mm-hmm. I don't get to dictate exactly how the thing happens and I don't actually mm-hmm. know if I'm going to survive it. Like that's how internally to me oh, it's sort of oh. traumatic they are. Mm. Uh, but I've been can't through, look. I've been through a lot of them. I've, I, I was telling Andrea, I've been like, this has happened once a month for this entire two years, something of that magnitude. And it's mm. not, it's not ever something that I see coming. It's just, that's what it is. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is not on that scale, but when women go through menopause, and they have some of them don't really feel much of anything, but many of us really go through really huge energy shifts and mm-hmm. these hot flashes. It's like your whole body is on fire, and you know the energy is moving. And other times you can't remember anything and disorganization and fatigue and unable to sleep i mean you know the body's a very mysterious creature yeah well because like for me i i'm more mental i'm more i know you are intellectual (laughs) and i like i i enjoy that aspect of my own being because it's not painful like i can think about a billion things at once or think of nothing or connect all these points instantaneously but then Mm -hmm. when the body is trying to have all this stuff come through then you know my mental wants to somehow categorize that or say like this is happening and now this is gonna happen or whatever you know like but i I also know that's i also know that that's pointless so yeah. Well, you're in this body. It certainly feels like there's a a, a real gr- a, a meaning in this incarnation stuff. Uh-huh. You know, you're in this body, so it's not enough to just be mental and in the mental realm. Right. So your body drags you into these places. <laughs> just like, listen, I'm in. He- I'm here. It's not all thinking. You right. got to feel this. You got to sensate this. Right. Well, I, just don't, I just don't like I don't like it necessarily. Like, <laughs> I'll get well, yeah, like body tremors and trembles and and also, you know, it's not just random like it's always associated with some sort of escalation of happenings, mm-hmm. a synchronistic sort of seeing of something and then that I have triggers I guess in me that will yeah. trigger like triggers. a body reaction. Yeah. Mhm. And you know I'm kind yeah, of if I, used I was to it. Say if I, <laughs> go ahead. I'm kind of used to it, but it's it's still not like it's it's still different every time when these sort of things happen. I, I still have a difficult time in placing exactly why. Mhm. 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 
But at the same time, yep. getting through it, I'm stronger yep. afterward, and, you know, mm. also just, it's what it is. Life is what it is. I don't know. Well, I have empathy. I'm, I mean, it does sound like it's very hard when it's happening. Mm-hmm. I, I think uh, I have a very severe trauma history, very severe starting kind of day one. And I've worked on this my whole life and I, I've become my own really deep friend. And like I'll be walking in the woods and I'll hear a footstep and I go into like total panic mode and I turn and you know, maybe it's a runner or whatever. But I'm telling you, it's all from some instinctual place, you know, fight, flight, whatever. But the whole world stops and yeah. goes into that terror place. And then it passes, you know, because I realize nobody's going to kill me here. And it was very funny. I, that happened recently. <laughs> and then I was walking and the ma- a man was walking his great big Bernese dog mountain dog or whatever and his huge dog and he said this dog gets really scared by people or something and I looked at him and I said yeah I know <laughs> you know I, I feel the same way as your dog <laughs> it's that's instinct so maybe you're processing a lot of old stuff that you can't you know there's no story for at the time yeah it, it's it's definitely connected with something in my past but uh, and maybe even past lives, if such are true. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I don't know if I've told you, but I had this, this this weed experience in my early 20s that took me very deep into the subconscious. Like, as deep as I know that it's possible to go, at least for me. And mm-hmm. it was extremely traumatic. And... Uh, That may have triggered remembrances of other past lives of just what the realm, what the world is as a whole, what it is, what it is that we've been doing, especially if people have been reincarnating over and over uh, for whatever reason, uh, sort of that sort of got me remembering uh, what this possibly could be at the very minimum. And then, but it also, once I was out of that uh, sort of constrictive relationship, it the the weed experience sort of allowed me to not just see the world in terms of the society norm thing because I couldn't do that anyway even before the weed experience and after that I really couldn't do it like there was no possible way Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so it's kind of been for me after being freed so to speak uh, I have this balance between extreme trauma and sort of the stillness that I know exists even within that and then afterwards even more so obviously mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. I can actually explore my own self mm-hmm. even with the sort of knowledge that these things will probably continue to keep coming mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah I think I'm finding that as I age you know, you you see that you feel stuff that's been there before. You see stuff. You uh, you know, it's not like it's all brand new. It's not. And it's like getting used to whatever. And it's just I'm much calmer about the whole thing, the whole program, <laughs> whatever this program is. <laughs> I just it's like oh okay. Yeah. <laughs> and at times, truly, truly enjoying the wonder of the differences and the different appearances and the surprises and you know and nature I love nature you know nature continuously is a good experience except when it's being assaulted (laughs) which (laughs) you know I try and stay around some nature that's not being assaulted fully Mm -hmm. but yeah speaking of nature how's your little guy Jess he's good he's good let me show you a picture is he like four or five He's three. Three and a half. <laughs> See, time, you know? Three. Three's a great age. Oh, my God. Three's a great age. Yeah, he's, he's a good baby. He's not a baby anymore. He's a good boy. No, he's a little guy. He says he's not a baby anymore. No, he's not a baby anymore. The baby's always in there. 
I mean, I, I can remember my children from labor on, but they're this, you know, they're grown ups now, but it's all right there. I can see it all. I get it all. I'm enjoying the grown ups in them. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're the same. Well, I think we're supposed to be able to retain this, the same spirit that you come in as, which is innocent think, and aware. Yeah, I see that. It's great. I really, really love knowing my sons as they grow. We have a, a really easy relationship, all of us. Here's, this is a good one. I don't know if you can see. Oh, that's good. You both look great. What handsome guys. <laughs> yeah. We're hanging out at the Thank lake. You. Thank you. Uh-huh. <laughs> So he's good. Do you, do you get to see him very much? I see him once a week. Since I moved here to Vallejo, then I'm probably going to see him like once every two weeks and FaceTime or call at least mm -hmm. once a week. But mm -hmm. uh, since we split, then that's kind of how it's been. Is that all final in terms of, you know, everyday reality? No, I mean, I, I could see him probably more often but we became I don't actually need to see him more than a week once a week and I don't know necessarily that he needs to I just know that this is how the situation has worked itself out to and I mm -hmm. make sure that I do see him uh, once a week and we, s we spend the day together and go explore Good. or go visit family or whatever mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it may change at some point uh there are, you know, tensions. There are some tensions, obviously, but mm -hmm. I, I hold my own with regards to Good. those. Good. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, <laughs> this life is a process of integration and deintegration and growth and reintegration. You know, it's things fall apart and come back together in a, usually a bit of a more sophisticated, differentiated way. Mm -hmm. And we do things when we're young. You know, who knew <laughs> the consequences? Big. <laughs> I don't know. You never know. Mm -hmm. I, I, I couldn't see any of it coming. I didn't... Even when I was doing the regular path sort of thing, like, go to school and get the thing and get the job even when I was trying and attempting to do that it still wasn't working and I still got pushed off into the sort of fringe even of normal life and then you know I had the sort of mind expansion things happening and I got pushed way across past even that normal outside fringe but then where I'm at now makes much more sense than trying to do the the society thing because the society thing to me is complete insanity so so would you say that um you feel like there's more people where you are now in a sense than there than you were aware of when it all the the initial stuff happened there are more that i'm aware of uh <laughs> that i was not previously aware of before um yeah. but still you know and i see people all the time uh, generally speaking, most people are on the, the rat race sort of mentality, mm -hmm. uh, sort of blind, you know, going through that. Um, I wouldn't say there are necessarily more. I think within the community that I've become a part of due to my exploring, uh, I would say mm -hmm. the mentality is becoming a little more free in terms of not being so scared of, like, speaking your mind. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I definitely yeah. see that sort of trend, but as far as the populace in general, the the blind are still blind and the, the awake ones are still awake, you know, and how that resolves itself, mm -hmm. I don't really know if it ever, I don't know if it does. So, uh, would you say you're a millennial? <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know, I know, that's very concrete, but you know what I mean. <laughs> I mean, you're not anything, but... I'm not anything. I, I don't know. You know, like, I would is, say... I mean, I'm, is that I'm, the generation? I have, I have clarity. I personally have my own clarity with the situation, but there's not a lot of reciprocation as far as... And that's without me trying to blindside someone with knowledge. That's with yeah. me being myself and seeing if somebody recognizes me or not. 
<laughs> that still uh, is minimal. But maybe maybe I just enjoy being not being bothered by everybody. I don't know. That's also a part of it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You dream? Yeah. Yeah. I'd be curious. You don't have to tell me any dreams, but I'd be curious <laughs> if your dreams are you know what they're like because you're in a dreamy world as it is in this waking world they're kind of both similar like Uh i'll have dreams about people and situations and then i'll wake up in the waking this waking life Uh and i'll think about them and be like oh there's a correlation there you know we probably communicated in the etheric but I still don't attach any more weight to that than I do when something happens here. Like, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm very detached in terms of meaning. I'm not detached in terms of, like, actually communicating with people when I'm speaking yeah. with them. Yeah. As far as, like, mm-hmm. trying to say, this is the thing, and now let's go do this with it. I don't do that very much. Yeah. And my, my own experience is that every time I come back around to a dream or a symbol or whatever... Wherever I am at that point, I'm bringing more of myself to it. Mm-hmm. You know, so if I have a dream from last year and I look at it now, I'll, I'll, you know, it it yields a different kind of milk this year. Right, right. It's you, nothing's really static. Finally, nothing's really static, and like that's the thing that most people have a difficulty coming to terms with because they are taught the platonic world they're taught the world of static form and form isn't even static but somehow like our minds have been programmed to think like this is existence and it's like this exactly which is just well, a bunch of bullshit part of why people have trouble with <laughs> the whole notion of death it's yeah. like you know if you're really in the material world and that's where you are this death thing just makes you know it's just like un, un, unfathomable right but it's completely natural in it's actual in what it actually is and it's actually necessary like even if you take the basic thought form that says like what if people didn't die aside from bore, boredom and the monotony and like I'm tired of this <laughs> bullshit you have like bodies stacking up like there's not even enough room to hold all the bodies there there there, there are lots of problems with that sort of notion yeah yeah I think my, one of my sons wrote a story in I don't know, junior high or something but they it was about living on this island in a society and no one could be born unless somebody died you know mm. it there was this exchange that had to go on yeah that makes because, that makes total sense. It's I mean, just considering the universe as a whole, it's balanced. It is balanced. Even if you know you see something in society that's like, wow, how is this possible? Almost like you need to remember there's something invisible that you can't really understand, or maybe it's outside of your field of perception that totally explains for why that anomaly has appeared in the first place. Right. Right. Yeah. So I carry that knowledge whenever I'm hit with a blast of energy and I don't know where it's coming from. Then I'm like, well, I know this makes perfect sense for whatever reason because it has to. <laughs> I just don't know what it is. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what it is. Somebody, something is playing with me. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe it's me. You Maybe know. it's me. <laughs> I don't know. So um, how does this show work? I mean, do people tune into a special oh, channel? Oh, uh, it's YouTube. Or? It's YouTube. Oh, it's YouTube. It's on YouTube. Just Is, if you want to look so, at it, go look. Just look up my name. It's just my name. It's Gary Warmerdam. Uh, I probably have done fifty different shows all over the world, plus some locally. Um, yeah, I mean, I have a for the tiny amount of people that are actually subscribing. You know what it looks like. Two thousand. I have actually like a big audience and. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's, it's, I. It is what it is, you know. I enjoy it. Good, good. The Gary Warman Show. It's called the Snail Show. <laughs> oh, that's right. I'm sorry. <laughs> how did you get? How did you get snail? Uh, SpongeBob. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. I actually never saw it in action. I just heard about it. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. It's a snail that just meows. It doesn't speak. Oh. It's very good. <laughs> oh, do you know Mr. Rogers? I've watched. Did you? I've watched. I, I didn't have TV growing up, so I didn't like. Oh, right. You missed it. Did, yeah. uh, ask Andrea, does she know Mr. Rogers? Yeah. She does. Yeah. Okay. Well, I visited a woman recently who was a um, 80 something. And she had uh, distributed a film her husband had made years ago. Um, he was a composer all over Europe. And he, I think he had a terminal illness. And he started listening to his dreams and he started drawing these incredible pictures. Mm -hmm. And the main character was a little old dachshund dog. Yeah. And so the, the film's called um, An Appointment with a Wise Old Dog. Anyway, it's really about alchemy and transformation. It's in the artwork, beautiful. And um, anyway, she, he died, and she had, I don't know who put the film together, but anyway, Yo Yo Ma, the great cellist, was his friend, and he opens the film. So anyway, I, I had that film. I used it for teaching about animals years ago. And I just saw her name, the wife's name. I knew he had died, and she happened to move to this area. I mean, she was in Europe. She moved nearby. And I just wrote her, and I said, um, do you want to have some tea? Mm -hmm. And we had one of these conversations. <laughs> you know, we were all over. But then at some point, she said, would you like, I want to show you a picture. So she comes back, and it's this, like, three two by three or three by four foot poster size picture of Mr. Rogers holding the stuffed dog that belonged to her husband when he was a little boy. That is where the little dachshund came from. And Mr. Rogers and her husband were extremely good friends as, an, as adults, and they had, would write letters via their animals to each other. <laughs> Mr. Rogers was a, a pianist, and this brilliant guy who got gentleness. He got the power of gentleness mm -hmm. and kindness. And so Daniel Tire, Tiger would talk to this little dog. What was he called? Alfonso. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so this kind of wildly unexpected tea occurred. You know, all that synchronicity. You know, it just happens, but you have to be, you have to open the door. You have to like say, do you want to have tea? Yeah, right, right. That's something I noticed uh, with my channel. Generally, I don't go out looking for people. I kind of do sometimes, but what I, what I did notice was that with asking people, uh, they're not they're not going to do anything like say no never going to do that they're, they're just going to talk to you and they'll say yes or no and they'll they'll kind of already be with it at least the question mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. it's very simple like it happens or it doesn't and whether the person is somewhat famous or not has or they have you know titles or whatever has nothing mm -hmm. to do with that own person's individual self and how that mm -hmm. reacts to sort of the offer mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you can go do that with anybody. I mean, any one of us can go talk to some yeah. famous person or a not famous person or anybody. Right. And you'll always right. get sort of the same response as long as you're not projecting out that they're going to... Maybe even if yeah. you are projecting out, you still get the same, like, honest response. I don't know. Yeah. Nice. Nice. We psych ourselves out a lot. Yeah. And I think... I think base, my deepest sense is we're basically kind. Mm -hmm. and that we are interested in connecting with one another as humans. I think that's gotten kind of botched up, <laughs> to say the least. <laughs> Slightly. But I think basically we're pretty related. We're mammals, mm -hmm. you know? We're mammals. That happens to be part of our uh, schema, you know? We are animals. <laughs> and, like, so. look at cows or whatever. They like just hanging out. They're, they're not hurting each other. They're not doing anything special or whatever. They're sitting next to each other like right that's what the right. society seems to have done to try to prevent somehow is get people not just hanging out and simply communing with each other right yeah and like you separate and it out into a thousand in, no yeah I, I know it's coming I up in, the end, go but, in a few minutes yeah but anyway i was thinking um there's a woman 
what is her name? She's in England. I'm forgetting her name, but she's written on um, basically the the suppression of the goddess, and mm-hmm. that we've gone through this huge, long piece of patriarchal whatever. Yeah. But you know that it the feminine this this place of relatedness is really where the great power is. Mm-hmm. Not, not in hierarchy and domination and eating one another, um, but uh, <laughs> I can't. I'll, I'll send you her name at some point. But she's English, and she's in her eighties, and she has lots of stuff on YouTube, mm-hmm. and um, she's she's this elegant older british woman and somebody i know read her book and really liked it so she wrote her and they've been communicating it's really cool yeah so anyway um i hope you have wonderful winter whatever you do over these (laughs) days and it's really nice that andrea's there and the and the dog is that is that dog your dog her dog your i guess it's mine now kind of (laughs) She's what, ours. What's the dog's <laughs> name again? Saki. Ooh, I like that. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. She had a sibling named Sushi, right? Or <laughs> actual sibling? Fr- friend. Yeah. Sibling friend. Oh, that's great. <laughs> Sushi passed, uh, so Andrea went through her, sort of her own death and dying thing with that. And she was in a, her uh, trailer taking some mushrooms and exploring her inner self and doing all these things prior to coming and hanging out with me. Oh. So. Yeah, you're a good match. We're a pretty good match. Yeah. Well, good to be in connection. Mm Mm-hmm. Okay. Thank you for coming on, Penny. It's good to see you again. Thanks for the invitation. Good to see you, too. Thanks for uh, emailing me. It's too (laughs) hard to do it on your little phone. Yeah. (laughs) Okay, thanks again, and okay. and I know our paths will cross again. They will. They will. Okay, all, all right. right. Have a good one. Bye-bye. Bye. Peace. Mm-hmm.